What you, what you looking at me like that for? What, man? Come on, you just drove down here? Yeah. Where is you, Sharon? For a long time, try not to remember. <laughs> I try to forget all those times. At some point, you gotta decide for yourself who you're gonna be. Can't let nobody make that decision for you. You won't tell him why the other boys kick his ass all the time. What's wrong? I'm good. No. I ain't seen good. And you ain't it. Remember the last time I saw you? Don't listen. To who, Ma? Huh? To you? Who is you, man? I ain't seen you in like a decade. It's not what I expected. What did you expect? Hello. Welcome to Movie Umpers. My name is Bob Sham. The sounds of your maybe dogs. Uh, this month uh, is our second annual Movies Are Gay theme in which we discuss LGBTQ movies that are directly by or adjacent to or about a lot of classic subtext and a lot of modern sad shit, right? And this one, that's kind of a big stereotype with a lot of gay movies that get trotted out, especially with the one we're discussing today which is a, a very good movie. Yes. As good as this movie is, it isn't without its tropes, or my dog is has to wait until we hit record to start throwing the tennis ball around the house. But look, uh, today we're talking about our Academy Award winner, winning film by Barry Jenkins, Moonlight from 2016, written yeah. by Barry Jenkins, and based on a play by Terrell Alvin McRaney, and it stars Alex Hibbert, Ashton Sanders, Travante Rose, Mahershala Ali, Naomi Harris, Janelle Monet, Sherelle Jerome, Andre Holland, and many more. And a few of those actors I named are playing the same character as this yes. takes place in uh, a boy's life in three different parts. Barry Jenkins discovered this uh, play by Miami resident Terrell Alvin McCraney. And apparently his play, from what I read, it was... Very focused on a semi-autobiographical play that was about his mother dying of AIDS. Oh. But it also had the same structure. And from what I read, the play has all the characters at once. And it's like a reveal that all these characters are around. And it's a reveal halfway through that they are the same person. So it goes back and forth between the three stories as opposed to us getting it in three parts. They're all at the same time. Wow. As I read, I'd like to see how that's executed. That would be really interesting. That sounds to watch. very unique and creative. Yeah. But it it seemed to be focused on his mother dying of AIDS and probably is coming of age as well. Naomi Harris played the mother here yeah. and she did a great job. She did a wonderful job. It seems like the play probably layers that character a little bit more than what we get in the movie here. As good as she is, she does seem to embody the most tropey aspects of the underserved black community. When we first meet her, she's in nurses. She's like in a, so it seems like she's beginning her descent. And by the time our character is a grown adult, she's in a home, not doing well, but is attached to the stability of the home that she's at. They don't spell out too much directly, which is pretty great. What is implied is that she was in this home for treatment. She can't go back out into the world. She, or she's afraid to go back out into the world, and they have offered her a position. She can live there for free if she works for them. Mm. And she's helping other people. It is the first time... In her life, since she was a nurse, I believe that she's truly cared for people. She says to Sharon, 
that she knows she was she did not love him when he needed her to love him. She was unavailable. Yeah. Well, she was also an addict, and this is also about a boy, uh, a gay boy growing up in an underserved neighborhood, mm -hmm. and what he's got to go through in this community. There are no white people in this movie. I think you kind of see background players. They could be Latino. I don't know, but this is a, a predominantly black film. So when we meet Little, as they call him, in Liberty City, Miami, and this takes place at the height of the crack epidemic. He's running from some boys. He's getting picked on. It seems like boys his age have this instinct of who he might be and who he is. And they pick on him for it. This is a story that so many kids can relate to. A drug dealer played by Mahersha Ali, who is a fantastic actor. Like, he's... Amazing. I remember seeing him in House of Cards, a show that got canceled. And on many levels, but he played this character named Remy. And I remember I was like, oh, this character is interesting the way he plays him so controlled but vulnerable. And then I watched the Luke Cage show where he plays Cottonmouth. Right. And it was such a bummer. That's what I know him from more. That character dies halfway through. But the but I knew he was great by seeing how he portrays, like the way he holds his face yes. in both of those roles. But now this guy's like a big time actor. And like everyone knows this guy's fucking good now, right? There are certain actors that can tell you everything you need to know by the slightest glance. This, and he's one of those people. This is the quietest gay movie I've ever seen. You know? It is very quiet. For a gay movie? <laughs> this is a movie about someone feeling suppressed. Sharon never gets to a place where he, until the end, where he feels that he can be honest with anyone aside from, well, Juan. Yeah. and He uh, can talk to Juan. And Juan's girlfriend, Teresa. Janelle Monet. Janelle by, Monet. She's beautiful, she right? She is a person who does not look real. She's like. she. If you told me she was created by AI to be perfect yeah her she, skin is so smooth she is like has a she, there's something her stunning about so her white and the even like her music she, in the in her career yeah. now that she's making she's making like these she's really doing what she wants here yeah. with her music and like i'm not up on everything she does but i kind of i'll peek in to see what she's up to and she's like you know, there are pop singers and stuff, but it seems like she's like a real artist, right? She's also she's so trying. stylish. Yes. She tries shit. She's yes. trying to be different. She's trying to do things a little differently than she's other people She's not trying do. to fit into any box or cookie cutter mold. Like, she's made like like these conceptual science fiction mm -hmm. albums. It's like, ain't no one else in, in, in her genre doing shit like that. We don't know anything about Sharon's father. And again, they call him Little. And he meets Juan because Juan finds him after these boys chased him. But when Juan sees him being chased, he's checking on his guys on the corner. Because Juan is a drug, a drug dealer. dealer. A he's the boss. Pin, basically. Yeah, he he's runs the, boss. the trap. Yeah. So he's checking on things and he sees that happening. And he goes and finds him and says... Oh my god, <laughs> Bruce! <laughs> toddler. He is. He is a toddler. I Bruce swear to God. Here. Juan goes and saves him. Finds him in this abandoned apartment where he's truly just picked up a crack pipe and is looking at it. He does not need to be in this space. And Juan tries to get him to talk, and he won't speak. When the white people of the academy saw him holding up the crack pipe, they were like, "This is very powerful." <laughs> He won't speak, so Juan ends up taking him to dinner, still won't speak, takes him back to his house and says, my girl gonna get you to talk. Mm -hmm. And Janelle Monae is like, you know what? You don't have to talk to me. That's fine. But come in, I'm gonna feed you. And he still won't speak. He finally tells them that it's just him and his mom. And when she asks about his dad, he goes quiet again. And he won't tell them where he lives. And so she says, okay, you can stay the, stay the night. Their relationship is solidified in this 24 hours, when Juan takes him back the next morning to his house and the mother is there. And who is you? Nobody. I found him yesterday. 
found him in a hole on 15. Yeah, that one. Some boys chased him in the cut. He scared more than anything. He wouldn't tell me where he lived till this morning. Well, thanks for seeing to him. He usually can take care of himself. He good that way. But... You get the idea at the beginning that she's a single mom who's frustrated and needs her son to take care of himself. She's so unavailable that she can't really stop Little from running to Juan's house. No. And Juan just, you know, except he does take him in. Give me a head. Hey, let your head rest in my hand. Relax. I got you, I promise. I'm not gonna let you go. Hey man, I got you. And Juan is a very calm, seems to be very kind. Yeah. Um, and but he's a drug dealer mm -hmm. and he's contributing to people aren't home taking care of their fucking kids. And at one point, she's literally smoking with her man right by where the spot is, and that's a big no no. So Juan goes out there and realizes it's her. Realizes it's her and tells her to go home and she's like, Well, you gonna stop selling it to me? And she calls him out. Tells you gonna him, fucking take care of my son now? But you gonna raise my son though, right? Hmm? You ever see the way he was? What? We watch his damn mouth. <laughs> you gonna tell him why the other boys kick his ass all the time? Huh? You gonna tell him? You ain't shit. And he really has no response to that. Little, he's getting picked on. He's being called the F slur, and he asks Juan what that means, mm -hmm. and Juan explains. A word used to make gay people feel bad. Am I a faggot? No. No. You could be gay, but you gotta let nobody call you no faggot. I mean, unless... He finds this person who is, at the same time, a drug dealer, a good person, kind, and accepting. Yes, you could say that the fact that he is a drug dealer makes him not a good person, but that's what's so wonderful about this movie, is the layers it lets people have. Aside from the women in this movie, truly, his loving girlfriend who is so kind, but that's yes. all we know about her. His mother is unavailable to him and an addict. an addict. And that is really all we know about her. Yeah. But the layers it puts on these men, even when we get into talking about Kevin, that's the boy's name, right? Mm -hmm. That he has the relationship with through the years that becomes his good friend. Even him, we watch him grow up. We watch them grow up together. And Juan is only in the first act of this three-act story. Little asks Juan if he sells. Oh, if that's he deals, right. Same conversation. He pauses on it, but he doesn't lie to the boy, and the boy walks off sulking. Because he says to him, my mom does drugs, right? And he says, yes. And he says, you sell drugs. So we go to the second act, Chiron. He's a teenager. He's still in communication with uh, Teresa, his mother is even worse, but Juan is dead. And he's a skinny ass kid. And his In little high school. And his little friend Kevin, he seems to be drawn they seem to be drawn to each other, but he's also getting picked on by this kid named Terrell. He and Kevin go out to hang out under this pretense that they're just boys gonna go smoke a blunt or whatever, but they end up on the beach and they have a sexual encounter with one another. And that kind of opens it, it seems like it opens Chiron up a little bit but he goes back to school the next day and he's just getting picked on and they attack him and beat the well his the, big bully the bullies they set up this game with Kevin to say oh remember when we used to like knock down stay down where you just walk up and you deck someone and they stay down if they get up you got to deck them again so they're baiting him and they get him to do it to Chiron. They just had a sexual encounter like the night before. And now they're 
goading him into beating up another boy, Chiron. And you can tell Kevin doesn't want to do it, but he feels trapped. And what does that mean for him if he doesn't do it? It's this ridiculous high school social pressure. He doesn't want people he doesn't want to stand down and look weak because he's also got to think about himself he's going to get the shit kicked out of him if he refuses and it's just a really difficult position to be in but Chiron fucking won't stay down and he keeps getting beat and beat and beat until he won't press any charges he won't say who did it so he wants so nothing really happens but when he goes to school the following day he takes a chair pro wrestling style headshot and beats Terrell like bad to where Terrell's like shaking on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then the scene for this chapter is watching Chiron get dragged out with handcuffs on, but he also appears to be, and you know, it's like a facade, but his most confident look when he's getting dragged out, like he's just reestablished a reputation. This is the beginning of him remolding himself. And it helps that after this, they send his ass up to Atlanta yeah. with his mother, and that gives him the opportunity to remake himself from the ground up, and people in his life are influencing him the same way that Juan was influenced as he was coming up. He also, when we get into this third act, he's the boss. He's emulating Juan. Yeah. That even was when, his father figure. Even wearing the do-rag the same way. He's yep. fucking He's jacked. got grills. He's jacked. He's got, uh, and he's he's trapping. He's doing the thing that Juan did. He's doing the thing that contributed to where his mother is. And his mother seems to be at a better place, but still kind of broken. Mm -hmm. We get an emotional moment between him and his mother. But he gets he gets a call. From Kevin. From Kevin. It's Kevin. You there? Yeah. Long time no see, right? And I had asked Teresa for your number, and, uh... Hold up, man. You... You you do remember me, right? Yeah. I do. This character, Chiron, is quiet. And Kevin used to nickname him Black when he was a teenager. Well, when he went up and moved to Atlanta, and he got to remake himself, and was brought up by gangsters up there... He starts calling himself black, like yeah. Kevin used to call him. But adult Chiron, Travante Rhodes, he has an interesting poise. Like, he wears the the suppression. You, you can see it. Like, there's an under-the-surface kind of feeling about him. And, yeah, we know that this is a suppressed child. We've seen this character grow up. But the, but the way Travante Rhodes plays him, mm -hmm. it just seems like... Like the shell of his skin could just burst and something else can just come right out from underneath it. I love the way you just said that. He really, and he explains that he went through some shit too and he got a girl pregnant young. He is bisexual. Kevin. Kevin, because, you well, know, he, he has, you know, he has done, he did things with Sharon, but he also kind of implied that he had before as well because he said to him, he's like, oh, this is the first time you've done something like this. Kevin says he's cooking at a restaurant. And he's not white. He's not cooking meth. But he's still in Florida. <laughs> he's still in Florida and he's cooking at a restaurant. He likes to cook. And he says, you know, I'd like to cook for you sometime. If you're ever in town. And what do you know? Chiron, black, uh, drives down to Florida. Just Immediately. for this reading And knows exactly where to go. And is it the same diner that he and Juan went to when they were kids? It's hard to say. Maybe the decor is different. But... You know, it parallels when they're when he and Kevin are sitting in the diner talking. Yeah. It has a it parallel, and you see the images above us here. I put those up for a reason. Yeah. We got Juan talking to young Chiron at a diner, and Kevin is talking to grown Chiron, I in a diner as yeah. well. So adult Chiron is wearing his do rag the same way that Juan does, and Kev picks on him about the way he dresses and wearing the grills. That ain't you, Chiron. Nigga, you don't know me. I don't know you. Man, what are you doing? This is not you. You gotta ask him in a few different ways. Yeah. Right? Because he wants to be sure that this is gonna go somewhere that he thinks it's gonna go. And I think this third act is really what sets this movie up because we're really dealing with tragedy. 
we're dealing with suppression and the suppression exists in the third act but it the third well, why the third act is my favorite is because even though it's tense and melancholy it is more of rom- a romantic tone yes. there like there is a you you kind of revel in the connection here mm-hmm. and it works and i and it just kind of breaks that that uh that sadness up absolutely the first time that we saw this movie when it came out it it really gutted me and it still does there are terrible things that happen in this movie it is a tragedy but this time on the rewatch i was able to pull out those more tender moments and appreciate the beautiful moments. And then even when they were teenagers, when it's just the two of them, Kevin has always been tender with him. But in this third act, he is that person always now. Mm -hmm. He has grown up. And as they talk to each other about their lives, Kevin even tells him, you know, I got a girl pregnant young. I'm a dad, I'm but we're parole. not together anymore. Yeah, I'm on that. parole. I spent some time, but since I got out, I don't want to be that way anymore. I don't want to lose contact with my kid. I I don't make very much money at mm. all, but I am happy because I am earning a living and I don't have to worry at all that I'm because I'm not doing anything bad. So they end up after a lot of back and forth at the restaurant and reconnecting, they end up back at Kevin's house. Yeah. It's more small talk, and then Chiron says, You're the only man that's ever touched me. You're the only one. I haven't really touched anyone since. And the movie ends on them essentially in an embrace. You can tell that they were probably intimate before or will be, but holding each other and they're just touching each other and they're just being there for each other. Kevin is comforting. There's electricity between them. Yes. And you know something's going to happen. The first time I saw it, it felt like, oh, this is, he's finally having someone, you know. But this time I was able to look at it more as hopeful. It feels as though this could be the beginning of something. Maybe not. I don't know. But Chiron does not have to go do what he was doing before. They could go back to their suppressed lives. But hopefully at least maybe perhaps these characters can occasionally just be with each other. Be with each other. Based on what all we've seen leading up to that, it seems like that would take a lot of time. Yes. But they could confide in each other in a way that they can't confide in it with anyone else. And yes. confide in Sharon and confide in Kevin in a way that's not exactly like how he could confide in Juan, but has that same level of trust and understanding yes. that the person knows who he is. Yes. And he hasn't had that. That's Moonlight, it's directed beautiful. by Barry Jenkins. Um this movie only cost $1.5 million to make. In 2016, it made $64 million. As far as like Best Picture winners, it's among the lowest earning. But that budget is so small. Yeah. For Like percentage return on investment in that? That's yeah, and crazy I'm, good. And I'm comparing uh, like the budgets. You see the budgets like five years later in movies. Like everything really got more expensive after... Pandy, the pandemic. I yeah. call it the Pandy. Uh, 1.5 million. That's a cheap movie considering what they spend on movies nowadays. Mm-hmm. Moonlight. It's a good movie. It's a really good movie. Best picture winner. I'm going to give it one through five each combined for best out of 10. I'm going to give it a 4.5. Five. So check it out. It joins the S tiers. I think it definitely is that third act, which felt unique and really brought it over the edge. Um, it, it, this movie had a risk of being a little too tropey, a little too leaning in on the tragedies of the suppression. Well, the suppression is the theme throughout, but that third act really, I think, set it up over the bar. Yeah. And that's why Moonlight is uh, right between Malcolm X and Mulholland Drive in our S tier <laughs> ratings. So check the show notes for links, other places to find us. It is uh, movies are staying gay for the rest of the month. Uh, like, subscribe, leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it, what you think of Moonlight. Any of uh, Barry Jenkins' other films, right? Right? 
I'm being curious about this play. The play is called In the Moonlight, Black Boys Look Blue. Juan says that a woman, when he was little in Cuba, said that to him. Yes, that is why it's called Moonlight. All right, more gay movies. Stay gay. You're gay. I know you're gay. Movies are gay, and so are you. Gay. I'm from Cuba. A lot of black folks in Cuba. You wouldn't know that from being here, though. This old lady, I was running, hollering, cutting a food, boy. This old lady, she stopped me. She said, running around, catching a boy that light. In moonlight, black boys look blue. You blue. 